This video lecture will talk about the structure and function of the integumentary system. This is otherwise known as our skin. When we look at our skin, we see that it's made up of several layers and also a variety of different structures that help the skin do what it does for maintaining homeostasis. So parts of the integumentary system include the, the two layers of the skin, uh, the hair, the nails, and a variety of glands that we see within some of the skin layers. And we'll talk about each of those individually when we approach that in this PowerPoint. Functions of the integumentary skin, uh, number one function is protection. It is our protection from the outside world. It keeps all of the sterile material in our tissues on the inside and protects us from all the bacteria, fungus, other pathogens outside of our body. So anytime we have a break in our skin, we have a potential for infection. So it's very important that we take care of our patients when they have potential for skin breakdown. Like repositioning patients that are lying in one position for too long helps to protect that skin layer. Anytime we have a break in the skin layer, there's potential for infection and eventually death if we don't control that infection. So anytime we're making incisions or um, dealing with injuries to the skin, we always have to make sure that we're watching those areas for signs of infection and responding appropriately. Sensation, we have sensory receptors that receive information from the outside and send that to the brain for processing to see if a response is required. We talked about that with negative feedback loops. There are temperature receptors in the skin and there are pressure and touch receptors in the skin as well that help to determine if a response is needed to maintain homeostasis. Temperature regulation, we also have sweat glands in the skin that when the temperature of the body is too high they release sweat and that is a liquid that is secreted over the surface and as that liquid evaporates to become a gas it takes heat energy with it and that cools down the surface of the skin which also results in a cooling of the body eventually. Vitamin D production occurs in the skin. Um, it starts in the skin and then the rest of that vitamin D has to be further processed by both the liver and the kidneys before it's finally being able to be used in the small intestine to help us absorb calcium. So it's important that you understand um, you know, vitamin D is produced in the skin in the presence of ultraviolet rays, but it needs further processing before it can be used in the small intestine to help us absorb calcium. So vitamin D is important for calcium absorption. We need calcium for a variety of reasons in our body, which we'll talk about this semester. One of them being uh, strengthening of our bones as well as nerve and muscle function. So without vitamin D, we cannot effectively absorb calcium and that's going to result in changes in muscle uh, and nerve function as well as bone strength. And we know that we need sunlight to produce, produce that vitamin D. You may have heard of seasonal affective disorder, which is a depression that some people encounter in the winter months when they don't get enough vitamin D because vitamin D uh, levels are also linked to emotional and mental health. So people that suffer from mild to moderate depression they have found often have low level levels of vitamin D. So it's recommended that people who do have um, depression um, look at supplementing their diet with vitamin D. Um, excretion is another function of the integumentary system and that is via our sweat. We can get rid of a little bit of urea which is a breakdown product from eating protein or breaking metabolizing protein in the body. So that's one other function of skin is excretion through the sweat. When we look at the layers of the skin specifically, there are two major layers. There's the epidermis, which is this top brown layer. It has a wavy bottom border. And then below that is the dermis. And we can see there's lots of structures embedded within the dermis. But these are the two layers of the skin, the epidermis and the dermis. This bottom layer, the hypodermis, is not part of the skin. So you might want to highlight that part right here, that it's not part of the skin. It's called the subcutaneous layer. Cutaneous refers to skin, so this is below the skin. The subcutaneous or sub-Q region, it's called. But when looking, if we look at these um, two layers, general statements we can make is that the epidermis is the non-living layer. It does not have any blood vessels. That's why it's given the term avascular, a vascular referring to blood vessels. It does not have any, so any blood supply it receives 
must diffuse up from the dermis where we see veins and arteries here. So any oxygen or carbon dioxide that is leaving or entering cells must do so by diffusion from the dermis. We can see too that the epidermis is made up of many layers of cells. We'll talk about that. It's a stratified layer. And the dermis is the strength layer. It's structurally strength, structural strength, which means when we are making an incision, for example, and we're closing that incision, the sutures would go th through the dermis. If we insert anything into the epidermis, that will eventually be sloughed off. So that is not a strong layer. It protects. It's, it's, a, it's a waxy layer. It protects us from water loss, but it doesn't necessarily protect us in terms of um, tearing, you know, deeper tears. That would occur in the dermis, and that can heal quickly because of the blood supply. So looking at the dermis then, we find that the collagen and elastic fibers that form the dermis, it's a dense irregular connective tissue, they arrange themselves along what we call cleavage lines. And when doctors are healing up an incision, say with cosmetic surgery, if they make that incision along a cleavage line, there's very little scarring. However, if you cut yourself in, in an accident and you create a laceration across the cleavage lines, there's more likely to form a scar. So that's um, something to be considered when we <clears throat> you know, had, perform a surgery. We want to make sure we're going along the cleavage lines to reduce scarring for that uh, patient. So the different cells that we find in the epidermis is our, a, a number of them. We'll start from the top and kind of work our way down. The first layer here, the top layer of the epidermis, are all dead keratinocytes. So these cells do not have any organelles anymore. They just have a large concentration of keratin, which gives us um, a waxy waterproofing layer because of the keratin. So those are the keratinocytes. So most of the skin is keratinocytes. And then if we look at this very bottom layer of the epidermis, here's a little uh, finger-like extension of the dermis. But this bottom layer of the epidermis has a couple of unique cells. One is the melanocyte. Melanocytes secrete a pigment called melanin, and you can see that melanin kind of um, is surrounding the cells, and that gives the skin its brown color. So the more melanin these melanocytes produce, the darker the skin color. So it's not the number of melanocytes that determine skin color, but it's the amount of melanin they produce. And we'll always see these melanocytes scattered among this bottom layer of the epidermis. Another cell are Langerhan cells. Those are not shown in this diagram, but those are immune cells. So we have the ability to fight infection right within our skin with the help of these Langerhan cells that are found in the epidermis. Merkel cells are special sensory cells that can detect changes or pressure on the surface. So if a mosquito lands on your skin, that pressure difference is transmitted down through the epidermis and stimulates this Merkel cell, which has a nerve ending which connects to the spinal to nerves, then to the spinal cord and to the brain to tell you that you have a mosquito that just landed on your skin. So the, that is a, a nerve cell or sensory cell. <clears throat> So what happens to this dead cell layer is eventually, with abrasion and friction, these cell layers will slough off. But the good part is that this bottom layer, this lower layer of the epidermis, is a living layer and it undergoes mitosis to replace those cells that are sloughed off from the surface. But this, this desquamination, this process of losing cells at the surface, is important for protection. And about every 30 days is when we develop a new layer of skin at the surface as these cells below rise to the surface and replace the cells that are sloughed off. <clears throat> so the process of cells dying as they rise up through the epidermis and becoming concentrated with keratin to form this waxy waterproofing layer, that process is called keratinization. Again, so we talked about desquamination, which is when you have these older dead cells sloughing off, but the process of forming this layer we call keratinization. So be sure you're able to define each of these two terms for the test. And think of some examples, for like uh, excess desquamination, where you have excess shedding of the skin layer, would be an example of eczema or dandruff. So looking at the, a little closer up at these layers of the epidermis, we see this bottom layer, the name of the bottom layer is called the stratum basally. 
And these, this is the living layer where cells divide by mitosis and move upward into the epidermis until they eventually die about midway through, lose their organelles, and just become filled with keratin. So the living layer is only at the bottom of the epidermis. It's a single layer of cells, and it's called the stratum basally. And then there's several other strata we can see before we get to the top layer, which is the stratum corneum, which is many layers of dead cells. So the, for the test, what I would expect you to know is that there are five layers of the epidermis, and I want you to know the bottom layer and the top layer, because those are the most important ones. So we have the stratum basally, at the bottom, which is the living mitotic layer, undergoes mitosis, and we find melanocytes here. And then at the very top layer is the stratum corneum, and this is the hard waxy layer that sloughs off, desquaminates, and is replaced over a period of 30 days. So looking at the epidermis just from a distance, we can see the stratum corneum, how clear it is because there's only keratin in these cells, no other or organelles that will pick up stain. But then if we look at this wavy bottom border here, these are the living cells. This is the stratum basally that lines this bottom border of the epidermis. And this is a one single layer of living cells. It may not look like one single layer in this slide here, but it is one single layer of living cells. The, the cells above it haven't quite died yet. Uh, the, this process of dying occurs as they rise upward through the epidermis, so you're going to see more staining of cells at this bottom layer. But just know that the very bottom layer is a single layer of cells undergoing mitosis. And underneath that is the, again, the dermis, and notice that the dermis kind of punches upward in these little finger-like extensions which are called papilla. And that allows that blood supply and that nerve supply to the epidermis to be nice and close so there can be good diffusion of nutrients into the epidermis because remember the epidermis does not have any blood vessels or nerve endings. So when you think of tattoo ink, tattoo has to go into the structural layer of the skin. So when a person has a tattoo, they're injecting that ink into the dermis because we don't want the, the t tattoo to slough off over the years, and we don't want it to go too deep into this fatty layer because that would cause it to be cloudy as it, uh, those fat cells absorb the ink from the tattoo. So the dermis is where tattoos would be inserted. The same thing with sutures. We talked about that just a little bit ago. Um, when we insert a suture to seal, he, um, seal up or close up an incision, we want to make sure we're reaching down into the dermis, pulling up and get, gathering or catching the other side and bringing those two sides together because we want to make sure that heals properly. So we need to bring the two edges of the dermis together. So it's the dermis again that's the structural layer. You can see the wavy border of the epidermis here. So they're grabbing that dermis underneath that and bringing those two sides together.